So today's, uh, tonight's talk, uh, not all plants are good for you. Is that a little too loud or not? Yeah. Um, I did this because Native Plant Society tends to do these talks on foraging and stuff, and they do these talks on herbal medicines and stuff like that. And I, as a physician, I, I have a problem with that sometimes and think you need to know what it is you're looking at and what some of these things are, because some of these things are really bad. And so when you're out foraging, forage with the correct things. Uh, we're going to discuss some native plants, uh, common introduced plants, and occasional fungus that are dangerous and at least irritating. What are you all doing? We okay, Bob? Or? Uh, give me a minute. <laughs> Recording in progress. Yay. Yay. Okay. So we're going to talk about plants that uh, uh, are not good for you tonight. We're going to discuss native plants, common introduced plants, and occasional fungus that are dangerous or at least uh, irritating. And foraging and herbal medicines, uh, be careful when you're doing this. So herbal medicines, uh, the active ingredient has been scientifically proven to work. Uh, that hasn't happened very often in herbal medicines. Uh, and when it has been scientifically proven, it's actually published in a real peer-reviewed medical journal. Uh, a lot of these things are not published in real peer-reviewed medical journals. The active ingredient is usually in the formulation in the bottle or in the herbs. Uh, there have been a number of different papers written about GNC and local pharmacies where they go in and pull these herbal medicines and pills off the shelf and go test them. And oftentimes they don't contain what's supposed to be the active ingredient or they contain bad stuff. Um, there are no active chemicals uh, and the, there are other active chemicals in the bodies like pain medications, steroids, Viagra, or diuretics. Uh, there are no bad adulterants in the bottle like lead, arsenic, cadmium, mercury, or bacteria. One of my family practice residents at Texas Tech a long time ago did a study of the curanderos and what they gave people all the time, herbal stuff and things, and found that, that there were over half of them had lead or arsenic or cadmium in them that these people were using as their medicine. Uh, there's very little FDA oversight of these herbal medicines unless they have been repeated significant serious side effects reported. And at the very bottom, thank you Senator Orrin Hatch. Uh, he's the one that led the uh, bill to have FDA have no authority over all these herbal medicines. And the reason he led the bill is because what's the number one manufacturer of herbal medicines in the United States? Herbalife? Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City, where Orrin Hatch is from. Plant extracts that have been scientifically proven to work are called medicine. Okay. So plant-based pharmaceuticals, these are all plant-based medicines that work. Uh, morphine, opium, aspirin, finblastin, which is a chemotherapy, digoxin, atropine, cocaine, colchicine, and on down the list. Okay, so there are things that do work that we get from plants. You just need to make sure they're scientifically proven to work. So herbal remedies. Uh, many biologically active chemicals produced by plants are defense mechanisms against plant predators. Uh, whether that's pollinators, whether it's caterpillars, whether it's a cow. While some of the plants active ingredients do have active pharmaceutical properties, many of them also include other chemicals that may cause significant side effects. Or the active chemical is very dose dependent. Sometimes there's a very narrow range of therapeutic um, uh, well-being for those drugs. This is why the purified chemicals almost always used in medicine without the other chemicals found in the plant extract. Plants that evolved in different habitats also produce different chemicals 
as adaptations to different predators and different environments. The active ingredients in plants harvested in one area may be completely different or more potent or less potent than found in areas uh, further away. So toxicity. Toxicity of a plant is caused by the inherent toxicity of the chemical compound or compounds contained in the plant and the dosage of the ingested compounds. So how, how toxic is it to start with? You know, milligrams per kilo ingestion or, um, and then the total amount that you swallow. So it's toxic in different species. Just because some animals can eat some of these plants without harm does not mean you can do it, or your pets, or your livestock. Many of the following plants are toxic to all animals, but some animals may ingest some of these plants without ill effects. So you can't just follow the bunny rabbit and figure out which things are the good ones to eat. So plants and fungi that poison you. Ricinus communis, which is the castor oil plant, it is not native, but it's found in our area along the Guadalupe River, where we do butterfly surveys at Guadalupe River State Park. It originates in tropical East Africa. This is what it looks like. Big palm frond shaped things. Some of them get 12 inches across. Um, this is the seed pod here. And this is a little bit better of the seed pod. And these are the actual seeds. So what do you get from that? You get castor oil, which is fairly innocuous. The main ingredient is ricinoic acid. Um, there is no real scientific evidence that castor oil that your grandmother gave to your mother, or maybe some of y'all are old enough they gave it to you, it really works. Uh, however, ricin is a very toxic substance. Ricin is found in the seed coat of the seeds of the castor oil bean. Ingestion of the seeds can cause ricin poisoning, especially if the seed is chewed. If you don't chew it and it goes all the way through you, you're probably okay, although I wouldn't suggest trying that. Um, but if you chew them or your dog chews them or your kid chews them, um, much more dangerous. Purified ricin has been weaponized and it's been found in envelopes mailed to congressmen and other folks before. It's, it's extremely dangerous when it's purified. All parts of the plant are poisonous. So it's, it's purified from the plant, it's not... It's purified from the seed covering. Right. But yeah. the, the people that are purifying it are purifying it from the seed covers, not... Yeah. Chemically. Yeah. So Datura uh, stromunium, stromunium uh, which is better known as jimson weed, thorn apple, moonflower, devil's weed, and there's a whole list of other names for this. Uh, it's probably native to Central America, although it's distributed all over the world. And y'all have probably seen these before. Um, that doesn't work. So the nice uh, one of the names for it is moonflower. So you get that picture of these are moonflowers. This is the seed pod when it's still green. This is the seed pod when it's ripened and brown. And these are the seeds. So these have. Uh, Hyocene, which is called scopolamine for us in the medical fields, atropine, and hyoscyamine. Uh, these are all very powerful anticholinergic alkaloids contained in this plant. All parts of the plant are poisonous. Inhaling burning material, eating the seeds, or applying extracts to the skin can cause hallucination and poisoning. Chewing and eating the seeds has caused the most fatalities. And there are people who actually try to use this to get high and have hallucinations. They make tea out of the roots. Huh? They make tea out of the roots. They, they do all types of things. <laughs> um, 
Atropa belladonna, which is deadly nightshade. It's another one introduced from Europe, but it's been naturalized throughout the U.S. Um, it's more it's, it's more common in certain areas of the United States than others. And then we have some Texas nightshades. So we have silver leaf nightshade, Texas nightshade, western nightshade, buffalo burr, and black nightshades, uh, all of which have varying toxicity, uh, but most of them are still fairly toxic. So don't eat the little yellow berries. This is what deadly nightshade looks like. And then a close-up of the flowers like this and don't mistake the little black seed pod there as a blueberry which apparently more than one people uh, persons have done and this is probably silver leaf nightshade uh, i naturalist didn't come back with a full um, id on this one but probably this is on my road where i live these contain tropane alkaloids, which are anticholinergics. Uh, again, hyamcine, atropine, and hyocyamine. These are very toxic. All parts of the plant are toxic. So this is a mushroom, Amanita phylloides, the death cap mushroom. Again, originated in Europe, but it's introduced in the United States in multiple different places probably came in with trees which were also moved from Europe um, and planted in the United States and probably, probably came from with the root balls and those is how we got many of the Floydies. This is what they look like. I don't eat mushrooms. I don't collect mushrooms. I don't go looking for these things. But this is what they look like. And this is just kind of showing you for how they grow up. And if you're a mushroom collector, you can look at how the gills are and how the fringe is and what colors they are and all these sorts of things. I, I, I'll stick with the ones in the store. So amatoxins. There's at least eight different toxic compounds within the amatoxins. They cause liver failure with as little as a half a mushroom. It's called liver, liver, liver failure. These toxins are heat stable, which means they survive cooking. And the symptoms have a delayed onset of six to eight hours. So you're fine, you go cook them, you eat meal, everything else. You know, six or eight hours, you start getting sick. Uh, there's no known antidote for these. Uh, there are several other Amanita species that are similar, uh, but are a little bit less toxic, but still bad. The Amanita, Amanita by Sporigera, which is the eastern destroying angel, more commonly occurs in North America and in this area. Now this is one that's a little bit confusing because it has three different names. Dermatophyllum secundiflora, Calia secundiflora, Sephora secundiflora, on labor johnson it's called sephora however it looks like their dermatophyllum is the one that they're going with nowadays most often um, this is the texas mountain laurel or the mezcal bean it's native to central texas and west to new mexico and down into mexico and this is what a big one looks like over here next out in uh, lando park and they have the purple flowers in the springtime which smell like grape soda. And then these are the beans, the bean pods. And then these are what the beans look like. And as we're discussing about how some things can eat these and others can't, this is the genestic caterpillar. And it seems to eat the new growth on my mountain laurels just fine, you know? Yeah, that's a little better. 
So these contain quinolizidine alkaloids, mainly cytosine. Um, it's a narcotic and hallucinogen similar to nicotine. It causes hypertension and tachycardia, confusion, tremors, dizziness, nausea, and vomiting. It has killed dogs and livestock. There's not too many humans that is killed. Um, these were used by the Native Americans to purge themselves, partially because it gives them hallucinations, but they also vomit usually um, from using these. Again, uh, these are kind of like the castor oil beans. They're much worse when you chew them than when you just swallow them and they pass on through. Here's a non-native, Nerium oleander. And I put this in because you know, half the people on River Chase have these in the yard. Um, grows all over the tropical and subtropical parts of the world. It's probably originated in the Mediterranean area. And this is what they look like when they're nice and green and have the pretty flowers. Uh, looks like they need to go on your leg when you go to Hawaii. And actually that's one of, it's a, in the same family. These are the seed pods here. And this is what happens to the oleanders in my neighborhood after it freezes, they go like this. So in, it has cardiac glycosides in it, oleandrin and oleandrogen. Ingestion will cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, irregular heart rate, poor circulation, seizures, coma, and death. The green leaves taste really bad, so not too many animals eat the green leaves. Kids don't eat the green leaves. But when it's dead and dry, apparently it doesn't taste as bad. And if you're having a bad year where there's not a lot of food, some of the uh, herbivores will try to sample it, and horses will. Um, the green leaves taste really bad. Uh, the dry leaves are more palatable. About 100 grams, which is four ounces, of the leaves can kill a horse. Okay. Cycus revoluta, the sago palm. Um, there's a couple of different sago palms. This is the most common one around. Um, this is native to southern Japan. And this is what they look like. And in the middle here is the, where the seeds are, that brownish uh, um, effluence uh, there is where the seeds are. This is what it lo usually looks like in my yard after cold snap. Uh, not in my yard, in, in River Chase. And then these are the seeds. So these have a glycoside called cycasin. Cycasin is cleaved by your gut bacteria into MAM, uh, which is hepatotoxic and a carcinogen. It causes apoptosis, which means programmed cell deaths. It makes your cells turn off and they die. Um, in the brain, which causes an ALS type symptom. ALS is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is Lou Gehrig's disease. So it gives you a disease, it gives you symptoms very similar to that. Uh, the seeds contain the highest concentration of the whole plant. And these are very bad for animals. Um, you know, a lot of, there's been a lot of dogs um, injured with this. Uh, Conia maculatum, poison hemlock, uh, native to Europe and North Africa. It's widely naturalized through the United States. Uh, this is the one that did in Socrates. And as you can see on the, uh, the far left over there, um, these have purple spots on the stems. That's how you tell the difference from some of the other um, carrot family stuff that you may see around. It has those purple spots. And then this is what the leaves look like. And this contains conine, which is similar to nicotine, uh, and G. Conicine, it's their piperidine uh, alkaloids. The entire plant is very poisonous, green or dried. Uh, six or eight leaves can kill an adult human. 
as Socrates found out. Um, often poison occurs when the victim confuses the hemlock root with wild parsnips, or the hemlock leaves with parsley, or the hemlock seed with anise or anise. Uh, whistles made from the hollow stems of poison hemlock have caused death in children. You know, just playing with the hollow stems. If the poison does not kill the livestock, it can cause birth defects. Um, Secuta maculata, which is the spotted water hemlock, usually close to water. It's also called spotted cow vein or spotted parsley. It is native to Texas. It looks similar to poison hemlock. Uh, it doesn't have really the spots, but it does have purple on the stems. The leaves look different. You know, they almost look a little bit more like marijuana. Don't try them. And then these are the roots that, that people will confuse with parsnips. Um, Cicutoxin, it's an unsaturated alphatic alcohol, alcohol that is most concentrated in the roots. It is probably the most poisonous plant in the United States, according to the books. Um, ingestion of any amount could be fatal. It is important for people foraging for wild parsley and ginseng to know what this plant looks like and how to tell the difference. And many more livestock die from ingestion of this plant. So plants that cause stinging, rashes, and itching. Uh, Toxodendrum radicans, or poison ivy. It's native to the United States and Texas. So this is a poison ivy from Land Park, near one of the areas I do water testing. Uh, this one may be a western poison ivy. It looks kind of like the pictures of the western ones. And I don't remember exactly where I got that one from. Um, this is adjacent to the uh, one of the spring runs at Landa Park by the uh, uh, little house there. Um, the uh, what's it called? Kiosk. The kiosk. The, the where the weddings all happen there. This is right across the river. You see, it's green in the in the summertime. It turns a pretty yellow and red in the fall, but it's still poison ivy. This is a poison ivy uh, from uh, Brazos Bend State Park. And then this here, Whoa. this is poison ivy. Wow. Okay, there are huge pecan trees in Brazos Bend State Park, and they have these poison ivies that go up 70 feet. And the green leaves are up in the top of the tree. And this is the size of the trunk. And this is a good case of poison ivy in my middle son, who is very sensitive to it. Um, where they played soccer for high school, balls would go in the, in the forest, and there's poison ivy in there, and the kids would kick it out, and he'd get it on his shin, and then he'd end up with poison ivy. So it, this is alkyl catechol, which is called, you'd normally call uracil. The uracil uh, causes an allergic contact dermatitis in most people. Some people do not seem to have a reaction to it. I've wandered through woods for 68 years now, and I've never had poison ivy. Of course, I know what it looks like, but I've never had it. So I am maybe one of those that really doesn't react to it. Um, it must be washed off the skin with soap and water immediately. Uh, clothes must be washed with good detergents. Uh, your dog can transfer it to you. And like I said, your soccer balls can transfer it to you. Inhalation of burning plants can cause severe respiratory distress and deaths. So you're hanging out downwind of the burn pile and you threw a bunch of poison ivy on there. Uh, you can have severe symptoms. Uh, topical Benadryl or topical steroids can help with the itching. And sometimes you require oral steroids um, if you have bad ones. Um, 
Nidos Golos Texana, or Texanus. Texas bull nettle, it's native to Texas. Y'all have, many of y'all have probably seen this. And if you didn't see it initially, you felt it. You know, it has a pretty flower, but lots of nice, pretty needles. This, the needles contain histamine, acetylcholine, and serotonin. Serotonin. Contact with the needles causes intense burning and itching. The needles often break off in the skin. After removing the needles, a weak solution of ammonia may help relieve the pain, and the seeds are edible. Now, who figured out the seeds on that were edible? I'm not sure, you know. Mikey, go check those out, you know. Tragia, uh, tragia urticafolia, or tragia betenofolia. Uh, I'm not a botany major, guys. You sound pretty good to us. Uh, huh? <laughs> Native to Texas, there are at least six species of tragia in, the, in Texas. And I think this is the betony leaf one. And I think this is the net leaf one. But these have calcium oxalate tipped hairs, and these cause severe itching and pain. They usually last like 10 to 15 minutes when you get them. And in my experience, they're usually found when weeding flower beds barehanded. Yeah, that's usually when I find them. Or on your glove when you scratch your Cage neck, you've been pulling. Because a lot yeah. of times that's the smaller plant from the weed you're pulling. Yep. And you don't realize you've got it, and then you scratch your neck or something. And so I'll leave a couple of those labeled at my house so when we have the tours and stuff like that, I have something to show the folks. And this is from the 2020 annual report on the Poison Control Centers. And on here, the, the number one up there is actually uh, uh, pokeweed. And I assume that's probably because people went out trying to eat pokeweed. Um, poke salad. Poke salad any, you know. <laughs> And pokeweed apparently in the springtime is much less poisonous than when it's later in the summer and it's gained some size. And so that's probably why it's number one. And then the cherry pits and the apple seeds and other things like that contain amygdalin or cyanide. They'll break down again, don't chew the seeds. Um, and then there's some others on there. And then the most... Huh? Apple seed is poisonous. Yes, yeah, it's, it's got cyanide. cyanide. Yeah. Don't chew it. Don't chew it. <laughs> so, what's the most dangerous native plant? We talked about it. The purple parsley, the hemlock. Yeah. The one in your yard. No. <laughs> nicotina tabacum and nicotina rustica, and about seventy other species. Native to the Americas. There's a couple in Australia and a few other places. This is Nicotinia tobacco, which is the one that they converted to use as the cultivated tobacco. Um, the rustica is more what the Native Americans used to use in ceremonies and stuff. Uh, the rustica has much higher nicotine content than the tobacco does. So these are piperidine alkaloids, uh, nicotine, and ambassine, and then nor nicotine. Uh, Jean-Nico de Villemont, the French ambassador to Portugal, brought seeds to the French king because he believed they had medicinal properties. Little did he know. Uh, nicotine is extremely toxic and was used as an insecticide in the early parts of the 20th century, but it killed too many farm workers. So they quit using it as an insecticide. In smaller doses, it is very addicting. Uh, nicotine is the last drug most poly drug addicts stop using. Anybody heard of green tobacco sickness? See, that's when you're picking wet tobacco in the fields. You can absorb enough of the nicotine to get sick. And usually, you. you and when it's absorbed through the skin and gives the person acute nicotine toxicity, 
you get nausea, vomiting, dizziness, weakness, headaches, and changes in your vision. That's the way I feel when I smell a cigar. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> So chronic disease is caused by smoking tobacco. Take your pick. <laughs> Coronary disease, myocardial infarctions, emphysema, COPD, periodontal disease, uh, strokes, aortic aneurysms, low birth weight babies, premature babies, depression, anxiety, addiction, liver cirrhosis, pancreatic cancer, head and neck cancer, lung cancer, renal cancer, myeloid leukemia, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, breast cancer, colon cancer, peripheral artery disease, asthma, bladder cancer, esophageal cancer, cervical cancer, stomach cancer, pancreas cancer, skin cancer, impotence, wrinkles, and many more. Whoa. Okay. What's the number one cancer killer in men in the United States? This is what I used to do when I did my health talks to everywhere from high, junior high kids to physicians and nurses. Lung cancer. Number one is lung cancer. What's the number one killer of women? Number one cancer killer of women? Lung cancer. Lung cancer. Lung cancer. Lung cancer. Okay. So deaths caused by tobacco, it's 480,000 Americans. World is 8 million people. For every death, there's 30 people who are living with a significant tobacco-related disease. Now, the nicotine, they couldn't figure out how to use it as an insecticide, so the guys up at DePaul University in the 70s figured out how to change the formula a little bit of nicotine uh, and make another type of, of uh, insecticide. So nicotine is a postsynaptic acetylcholine receptor agonist. That's on the quiz, okay? <laughs> um, it's an excellent insecticide, but its toxicity was at least as great for mammals. So that's what it tended to kill the farm workers. So the first one they developed was nithiazine. It's the first neonicotinoid uh, was synthesized in 1970. It didn't work too well in the sunlight. It was broken down very quickly. So they worked on it for a while longer until they found ones that would live in the sunlight. Um, and so now they've come out with a whole bunch of them. Thus, um, it's relatively less toxic to mammals than to insects. However, one of its breakdown products is more toxic to mammals. So the original product is, not, is worse for insects than mammals, but the breakdown products, some of those are worse for the mammals. So the neonic uh, insecticides, are systemic insecticides and are distributed throughout the entire plant. Uh, they are more stable and longer lasting than many other current pesticides. Many of the current pesticides before the neonics were after DDT, they designed them so they break down pretty quickly and wouldn't stay in the environment for a long time like DDT did. DDT lasted in the environment for a very long time. Um, these neonic insecticides are so toxic uh, to pollute uh, pollinators uh, they have been banned in the European Union, but not by the EPA. And this is just some of the ones, the names you can look for when you're looking for things at the grocery store or the box store for you might spray on your plants. These are all neonics. And then we have Audrey is one of the other dangerous plants. So that's it, guys. Thank you. Any questions? Anybody got questions? There might be some in the chat. Any questions on the chat? I didn't see anything worthwhile. <laughs> How many people we got on Zoom? Sixteen. Sixteen people on Zoom? Well, it's down to fourteen. We had sixteen at one time. PowerPoint be available. The two smokers quit. Go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> yeah. So would the PowerPoint be available? Other than that. Quick. Great. Thank quick, you. Quick question. Yeah? Where do falling branches and coconuts and such 
fall into the ranking of, of injury or death. Yeah, as somebody who's climbed a coconut tree, going after coconuts before, um, I don't know. That's a good question. You know, as some of my Boy Scouts figured out in Panama, do not climb the coconut uh, trees in your underwear. Okay, because <laughs> coming back down, it's really it's kind of rough and irritating. <laughs> Yeah, there are some places that there are other dangerous things other than uh, just the ones we talked about today. There's a whole book back there, and there are books y'all can take a look at back there. And there's a reference list that was sent to everybody. Y'all can feel free to look at those. Yes. Yeah, quick question. So, if we find some of these plants in our yard and want to get rid of them, not the oleanders, but I don't have those, but the other things, how do we do that? Can you? Wear gloves and pull them. Or? Yeah, just be real careful how you dispose them. Put them in a plastic bag. Don't burn them. Don't burn, burn them. them. Most of these you don't want to burn. You know. Can you repeat what the, you said medicine was again? Uh, medicine was um, herbal medicines that have been scientifically proven are, are called medicine. Got it. Peer reviewed right. in a journal. Yeah, in a peer-reviewed journal, and you'd be surprised. I I still get asked today to write articles for journals, not even radiology journals, that some of these journals want me to write stuff, you know, and it's not even radiology or tobacco. It just it, it's and a couple of their journals are owned by tobacco companies, so they their guys used to publish in those journals. Um, so you have to be real careful. What's a a real medical journal that's peer reviewed and, and, and is real. I guess there are a lot of plants that uh, the active ingredients uh, can be helpful, but without a prescription and testing and all, how do you know what amount to use? You that's know, right. A little bit might be good, but too much might be deadly. That's right. that's right. And the plant they pick from your backyard may have a, uh, a, a different chemistry or a different potency than one picked from my yard. You know, so that's why you standardize them. You extract the, the important chemicals out of them, and then you test them. And, and now we're not even going to test them on animals any longer, according to the FDA, which is a little strange, because um, that's where you picked up stuff that, you know, it didn't work in some mammals. And you had to be careful just going to people. Anybody else? Um. Thank you, says to remind everybody that Heritage membership this month are half price. Oh, Heritage membership this month is half price. There's a Heritage meeting if anybody wants to, to join or do, it's a fundraiser. Um, that was on one issue of my slide set for the things, and it, when I saved it, it didn't save. So mm -hmm. I apologize for that. And tell Peggy she can run over here and pick up her stuff I brought for her. <laughs> okay guys, that's it. We need to be out of here by eight or seven forty five. Great. Thank you. Yeah.